All right, so I just, I wanna thank you guys um, for caring. I wanna thank you for caring because I, my whole life when I was growing up and you'll kind of just see this threaded in my story, I had this false belief that nobody cared, nobody including God. And I guess it started out, I was born in Guyana, South America. And from a very young age, I, I didn't have a father. My mother has, you know, she raised me um, my whole life. I just had my mom. And when I was five, we ended up moving to America. But before we even got to America, um, when you're that young, the things that you remember aren't normally the greatest things. So I have a handful of memories from South America and they're not very, they're not very good. Um, and a lot of them aren't very clear. So anytime I go to counseling or try to talk to someone about them, it's hard for me to articulate these flashes, these bits and pieces that I get. I can't string together coherent sentences. So I bottled it all up inside. And later on in my life, they would come through in night terrors. And I would remember bits and pieces, but it would just be the emotion that would stay with me when I would wake up. And God has really um, given me a deliverance from those things. And I'll touch on that a little, a little more. But some things that I specifically remember. Um, I remember a little boy touching me. Um, I remember my mother stopping him. I remember my mother's um, nephew. So I remember him trying to kill my mother. I remember him breaking into our house at night. I remember flashes of screaming and I remember being terrified. We moved to America and um, my stepdad was amazing for many years and everything was, you know, it was new. I didn't know much about my heritage, but we would go and we would visit my aunt in Canada and we would go and visit my other relatives in New York in the summertime and things were pretty good up until I was 10. Now, before we even got to America, like a cute little story, my parents, they were pen pals, my stepdad and my mom, um, they actually met through some Christians, my mom's neighbor would take me to this um, Christian like school thing that they had for the kids down there, the missionaries were doing. And they met that way they, through a pen pal program. So even then, God was preparing the path for me to make it to America, right? But these are things that I wouldn't even understand until much later on in my story. So around 10, my dad gets into a car accident. And it was the only time I even really remember my parents fighting super, super bad. And my mother threatened to divorce him because he was going to take me and my brother and my friend. Um, my brother was an infant. Well, he was young. He's seven years younger than me. Um, he was going to take us on this trip. And she said he worked third shift and he didn't get enough sleep. So, and she had a bad feeling. And Hindus, Indian women, they're very particular about their, their instincts. If they feel something is off um they just won't go with it and she really flipped out and I remember this it was on Mother's Day and the man didn't take us I me and my friend were babysitting my brother and he flipped the van 40 feet in the air he flew out of it he died three times on the way to the hospital he was in a coma for a while he had to wear a halo things went really really bad and my whole life changed off of that he did recover but something was wrong in his mind and the littlest of things would set him off if i crashed i crashed his car one time as a teenager i crashed it into um the deck and he barely batted an eyelash but i would forget to turn off the light and he would flip out and really flip out and um so the physical abuse got a little worse and as I got older I became angry at my mother because she wasn't protecting me and she was drinking a lot and I was about 13 and um 12 maybe 13 I was in a trip to Canada and they had flown my mother's brother who um had tried to have my mother killed by his son multiple times over this house 
um, that my mother had been left um, by her mother. He, I ended up alone with him and they flew him up there because he was dying. And the man is in the bed and he's sick. And everybody else has gone somewhere and I'm in there and he drops this bomb on me. Even in his deathbed, he was bitter enough to tell me that my real father, who I always thought was dead, is alive. And um, suggested that my grandparents on, his, on my real father's side had wanted me, but my mother had took me. And it's an already rocky relationship with my mom and my stepdad was getting worse. And now my mother had told me, and I don't know what would possess her to tell me this thing as a child. I think she tried to make it seem like she wanted me, but she had told me that when she had gotten pregnant because she wasn't married, um, that they wanted her to abort me and she was taking pills to abort me. And she ended up in the hospital, must have been hemorrhaging or whatever. And um, she changed her mind and decided to keep me. I don't know how much of that is true. I really don't because my family is very secretive and they protect my mother at all costs. And they have told me nothing about my real father. Um, so I, I had this growing up. I had this, um, I didn't know where I came from. I didn't think anybody wanted me. I, I didn't think I mattered. My parents always worked. My mom and my stepdad, they always worked. And these are the lies that the devil invested in me from the time that I was a child, even though God had provision for me, made a way to America. We got our visa like that in a time when it was hard. We got our visa like nothing. He made a path for me. He guarded me. He protected me. I should have been in that vehicle that day that my stepdad crashed that vehicle. And the, it was literally smushed. We would have all been dead. He, the only reason he survived was because he didn't have his seatbelts on and he flew out of it. But the devil had planted these little seeds of lies all throughout my life. And I tell you that because I want you to think about your own life and how many little seeds ever since you were a child, the devil planted in your own lives to get you to shy away from the purposes that God has for you. So as a teenager, I didn't think anybody wanted me. I was sexually abused more than once. And I'm not going to go into detail about that because I, I'm just, it's not the, it's not. It's not the direction I want this to go. But I did have a woman, Leora Schoenherr, who I will never forget. Um, she took me to confirmation class. She went out of her way, came and picked me up every Wednesday, took me to confirmation at this Lutheran school and um, made sure I got there every Wednesday. And she laid this foundation for me because my parents were too busy, right? My mom was an alcoholic for quite a while. Um, and then the day I go to get confirmed, okay, so I'm probably like, what, 15 or something by this time. Um, I'm up there saying my verse that we all had, we all, the pastor picked a verse for us. We all had to memorize it. And I'm up there saying my verse and this woman is missing. And afterwards, the pastor pulls me aside and tells me that she's in the hospital. So we go to the hospital. She's like 72 years old, right? We go to the hospital and they diagnose her with cancer. She dies two weeks later. And... I was mad because this happened in a, in six months. My godmother, so my stepdad's sister, she um she'd passed away from cancer. My grandfather, my stepdad's um, father, who I was really close to, he passed away from cancer. And now this woman passed away from cancer, all within six months. And I was mad. I was just so mad. And just two weeks prior, I had this encounter with God that I will never forget. I was on my knees praying to God and I felt in such a tangible way the spirit of God encompass me, right? But in that moment, in that moment with them telling me that she had passed away two weeks, two weeks after they diagnosed her with cancer, I, none of that mattered. I was just so mad. And I said, if this is the God, if this is the God, I don't want anything to do with him. I really don't. And I didn't know in my childlike mind, I didn't understand that this woman's last mission from God, that she fulfilled her last act of service was to lay a foundation that I would fall back on years later at 24 when I'm in prison 
about to serve seven years because when I did end up, so I, I fall into drugs. I started drinking. Alcohol was readily available. I had my first drink with my mother. It was not a big deal. Um, my stepdad and I would physically fight at this point. I moved out when I was 16 or 17. I started selling drugs. I, um, I ended up having, I, I caught a drug case. I sat 14 and a half months in county. I got out. Um, I had gotten a boyfriend and I had got pregnant and um, I had another miscarriage. And it, my first miscarriage happened when I was 17. And that miscarriage happened as a result of a rape. And because of this, I had surgery. They removed one of my tubes. They removed part of my uterus. And I was on painkillers. And that's what started the addiction. So now when I'm 19 and I have another miscarriage, um, this boyfriend introduced me to heroin because I was crying and I wouldn't shut up. And he just wanted me to shut up. And he shot me up. And... I shut up and I turned into a monster and he hated that person. And I, I looking back now, the shadow of the girl that I was back then, this woman can't even comprehend that. The transformation to me is it's, I'm in awe because only God could do something like that because I was in such a dark place. So I'm doing heroin. Um, I'm actively trying to kill myself at this point, doing everything aside from like slitting my wrists or something. Like I'm just hoping one of these days I'm going to OD. I just want to fall into oblivion at this point. I just want to just fall asleep and not deal with it. And God is the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I go to a treatment program. I run from the treatment program. I overdose three times in 72 hours and there was always somebody there to bring me back and looking back now I see God's care and his provision and I see that he for whatever reason I he kept me alive but at the time I couldn't see any of this I end up in prison well I end up in jail and I'm facing a lot of prison time and I'm kind of going fast because I don't know exactly how much time I have and I'm trying to be as concise and I apologize if I'm a little bit all over the place but you're fine. <laughs> I, um, I end up in jail. I'm fighting this case and I start having these night terrors like bad. And I would kick and scream and I would wake up with these bruises all over my legs. And at this point I'm like on a bunch of like mood stabilizers, antidepressants. They're just trying to put me to sleep at this point. I was fighting all the time, like physically altercations all the time. I was constantly in SAG. And I had this one doctor give me this book by Joel Osteen. And this is the funny thing though. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't ever read his stuff anymore, but God meets you where you are and he will use anything and anyone. That's why when people talk about certain pastors and certain preachers, I'm like, God will use both the good, the bad, whatever he will. So she gives me this book by this man and I read the book and it kind of sparks a little something. And then a CEO comes by one day and asks me, what do I believe? And it occurred to me, I had no idea. I said, I believe in me. And he's like, well, how's that working out for you? And he just left. He just left me with that in SAG. And I'm like, hmm, how is that working out for me? So I start researching, right? But I'm still not going to God. I start researching every religion in the book. Egyptian mysticism, Hinduism, Scientology, everything except God. And the night terrors just get worse. And one night, in the middle of a dream, I wake myself up saying the Lord's Prayer. And I hadn't said the Lord's Prayer in years. And my logical mind says to me, well, if you cry out to this God, subconsciously there might be something there and no matter how angry I am I want to know I want to know why why it, it starts this questioning inside of me like well if you are real why and so I start reading the Bible 
I don't even remember where I started in the Bible, but I know I progressed to one chapter a day, one chapter in Genesis, one chapter in Proverbs, one chapter in Matthew. And I, I started changing. And the change has been so distinct that it's provided me this platform to be able to share with people that have that know me from before and see that I would have never had because it has been so utterly blatant that I'm not the person I was. And I didn't make a conscious effort to change. I didn't say I'm going to be a good person or I want to follow God. On the contrary, I did not like God at all. And it took me a long time to understand and to see that all those times I thought that nobody wanted me, but God, God made sure that they didn't abort me. God made sure that I came to this country. God made sure that I didn't die in that car accident. God made sure that I didn't overdose without somebody being there to save me. So all of the lies that the devil had planted in me that I'm still fighting to this day, I fight feelings of inadequacy. I fight feeling like nobody wanted me. I run to relationships with men that mistreat me because I didn't have that father figure when I was growing up that didn't beat me or didn't demean me. I still fight these seeds of evil that the devil planted. But in sharing my story in times like this, when I think, like, what am I, how, how do I, because we're so multifaceted. When you asked me to do this, I said, well, what part of my story do I share with them? Do I share the drugs? Do I share the prison? Do I share, what part do I share? And I really believe God said, in my spirit, share the pursuit. Because oftentimes we don't see how God has pursued us constantly pursued us even though the devil will spew his lies and spew his deceit and we might latch on to that but god will not make it so much that his grace doesn't shine through even in the darkest of times and that has been now when someone asks me to speak and i feel inadequate i remember that he has called and equipped us all for such a time as this he has given us all our individual groups of people that he has put around us. And just seeing him now, when I see him pursuing one of my friends, I remember like, that was me. That was me a couple. And he's still pursuing. He never stops. He, he calls us from glory to glory. Right. But when I see him pursuing someone that's still in that life, I'm now I'm like, how do I help? How can I be like how that CEO was for me? How can I be like how that, doctor was for me because these people these people they had no idea when I was in prison he brought me to Gail and Gail and I established a relationship and here I am in this brand new city and I can see the threads of God all throughout my life and I wonder for you guys like how do you see God threaded throughout your life even in the midst of all the weeds that the devil has planted how how have you seen the goodness of God threaded throughout your life. And I'd really like to encourage you to write those things down because it's so easy to forget. It's so, and sometimes it isn't until you, it's in the sharing of our testimony, right? That our faith itself is solidified because when I'm thinking about all this, that's when I'm really seeing like, yeah, he did try to tell me, the devil did try to tell me that nobody wanted me, even though God had formed me in my mother's womb and he's loved me with an everlasting love. I, in the recounting of your testimony, that's why, you know, I think in Revelations, it says that they overcame them by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And these are the things that are there to help solidify and move us forward in our faith. But if we don't, if we don't really sit and write these things out or think about them or share them, it's so easy for us to forget. And it's so easy for the weeds to creep in. Like he has been guiding me a lot with um, Matthew 13, and the weeds and the tares. And I see all the terrible things happening in the world. And I have this one particular friend that um, she fell away from the church because her daughter committed suicide. And some well-meaning Christians said that her daughter is in hell. And I, we, we've been talking and she's like given me a platform to speak um, on this page she's doing and everything. 
and things were, you know, she's opening up, right? And then another Christian, a guy, does some things, does some things, and it's like two steps forward, one step back. And I, I brought this to God, right? Because I bring everything to him now. Being in prison when you don't have a whole lot and you don't have a voice and you don't have anyone to fight for you, you really learn that God will fight for you and God will provide for you and God will care for you. So now being on the other side of it, I bring this to God. Like, And he, and that's the thing that I love about him. He can handle our emotions because I'm a very, I'm passionate, but the opposite of passionate is anger, right? And I, sometimes my anger gets the best of me, but God has never, even though I've given him countless reasons not to love me, he has never forsaken me. And um, I bring this to him out of like anger. Like how, how can you let this happen? How can you let these people mislead people? Like, how can you let this happen? And he takes me to Matthew 13 about the wheat and the tares and the sower sowing good seed and the devil, the evil one coming in and throwing in the weeds. And they, the angels come and ask, like, would you like us to pluck them out? And he said, no, because in the, in the, in the plucking out of the, the weeds, you might, you might pluck out the weeds. And patience has never been a good thing for me. Um, patience has never been easy for me. But patience has re reaped such a harvest in my life. And these are the things, like, this is what I really want in sharing my story. I want to articulate to people how it is that God talks to me, knowing it's probably different from how, you know, God talks to us differently. But sometimes we don't recognize it as God talking. We just think, oh, this is a coincidence. This is a coincidence that this is happening. But threaded through my life, things that could have been coincidences were really divine appointment and protection and I guarantee you that if you look at your own life you will see that and we don't understand like I we don't always understand and we won't because now we see in fog right but one day we'll see clear so I get upset when I see Christians misusing Christianity or misusing their voice or distorting testimonies to harm or judge others but then I'm reminded by God that even in like even how that one pre preacher that I would never go to now to be fed right he reached me even then and even even though the world all these bad things are happening all the devil has sown seeds of evil in my life inadequacies fears doubts the devil throws in false, false prophets, false Christians, but still God has sown good seed. And it is our responsibility as Christians to take the seeds that he has entrusted with us and to then use that to bear fruit in another person's life. So I'm going to, I, I don't know like when I started, um, but I would like to kind of open it up for questions because uh, if it's one thing that I've learned it's that sometimes I don't know everything so I don't know if there's something that you guys would you guys would like to know something that you would like me to elaborate on and I kind of just want to open up to see what you guys you know what you guys are thinking where your head's at stuff like that Wow, thank you. Gosh, I need a sec to soak it in. <laughs> I, I know I can talk kind of quick and no, I, I'm no, trying no. to be like as concise as no, possible. No, it was great. Oh, it was great. I do have a question. This is random, but do you have a life verse? Um, well, I have many verses, but I, I always tend to come back to Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And that has always, for whatever reason, any trial that I'm going through any time, because I vacillate between feeling completely inadequate and I don't need anybody's help. I can do this by myself. Like middle ground is really hard for me. And the book of Zechariah chapters three and four have been my favorite my whole life because um, since I came back to God, because Joshua is standing 
in front of God in the courts in his filthy rags and um, the devil is there accusing him and Jesus stands on his behalf and he says is this not a brand plucked from the fire and I always felt like that was me like that is that is the embodiment of me because I I was a brand plucked from the fire he took me out of prison and now anytime that I'm fearful the next chapter I get the not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, because I don't have to rely on myself and I don't have to be afraid. It's not, it's not me. He will do it. So Zechariah three and four are my favorite chapters. I love it. Thank you. Love it. Nikki, a couple things that I just wanted to, comment on, I guess. Um, I just love how you've got this raw relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I, I think you might know what I mean. You know, um, there's some, some, some churches, some religions, you know, it's, it's there, there's all these formalities to, to having, you know, to talking with God or, to, you know, you got to pray this way, or you gotta, you know, you gotta go sit in the, the pew, look forward, that kind of thing. And it's, uh, you know, I like what you said about God will fight for you. Like when you were in prison, I mean, they just, you know, and I think we all need to remember that. Um, and uh, yeah, when I was in prison, like my, my, I was telling Gail earlier, my first two years that I did in County, I was a fighter and I was always fighting everybody's battles. I don't know. I had a, I was a little girl with a Napoleon complex, I think. And it took me a long time to internalize the fact that only those unsure of their power feel the need to prove it, right? Mm -hmm. So until I internalized that lesson, I was fighting all the time. And then once I got to know God um, and I got to prison, and you have a lot more to lose when you're in prison. Um, and you go to SAG for quite a while and it's, it's, it's hard, it's harder, right? You, you could lose your good time. Like you have a lot more to lose when you're in prison and you have a lot more freedom that you're not ready to give up. So God really started working on me, but people would test you. And when they know that you're a Christian, they will tend to try to push your buttons to discredit your religion for whatever reason. Um, to attack your character and I had to really learn how to pray to God to okay I need you to help me deal with this person because now the reality is we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses and how we behave potentially has eternal ramifications for another person so the reality of that at some point began to hit me probably around my second year in prison and I went my whole my whole prison sentence without going to SAG. Whereas my first two years in county, I, the longest I was probably out of SAG at a time was like 60 days. Like I was in and out all the time. But, and that's, that's another thing with the transformative power of God. Like I have no idea when exactly, like I can't pinpoint exactly when these things happen, but slowly and incrementally, my whole attitude changed and I saw him protect me. I saw when people tried to drop slips on me and me get in trouble, but by me walking with God and my character, I started, the, my character started laying a foundation of trust with the officers. And that's a foundation now as we're going in, trying to donate books, we're going to be dropping off a couple hundred books this week. We've gotten fans donated. That foundation that God laid even there is what's making it easier for me now to go back. And that's the intricacy and the beauty of God is that all these things that I thought, like when you're in the middle of it, you don't see how it could be used later on, right? Mm -hmm. But when you go back and you look and you see how he's been there the whole time, now I'm like, what I thought, it, and it's so multidimensional, right? Like his word, what I thought at this basic level Okay, it was him changing my character and doing, he was also on a deeper level laying this foundation so that I would be able to go back in and serve. Because in, in changing my character, he was changing the way other people view the potential of an inmate. So it's never really just about us. It's not just about me. It's not just about Gail or Nathan. It's, it's always 
there's always, yes, he cares and he loves for you and he saves you and he, he will transform you from glory to glory, but it's never just for you. It's so much deeper than that. And I didn't see, and you don't see that when you're plodding through your day. You just don't. Mm -hmm. Nikki, you, you've got a, a really, uh, an amazing gift. You really do. Um, I, I, you know, I, if I could encourage you to continue, you know, down this path as a communicator, as I listen to you, you know, throughout this year, your testimony is amazing, but you remind me of one of my favorite communicators and how you, your delivery and how engaging you are. Um, you're fantastic. Uh, Nathan commented um, on how raw you are. If I had a vision for what this is to become, you know, and I want to see this grow and I, I, you know, I've got big ideas on what I want to see out of, out of connect. Right. And I need to pray and, and see what comes to fruition from that. But I think if we're going to be different and we're going to really attract people having that rawness that Nathan, you know, mentioned is going to be so impactful versus the polished pastor up there that doesn't have that, you know, of course he's going to have a, a testimony, a history, a background, but the raw reality of what someone like yourself brings to this, I think will generate a charismatic, you know, um, atmosphere. And that's how I see this really growing and uh gosh you're you really impressed me i i appreciate that you guys even like it, to me it just shatters my belief of what i thought christianity itself was too because even in prison we have this stigma just like how people have a stigma of inmates we have a stigma of christianity and churches and when I had gotten, when I sat my 14 and a half months in county and I got out, I had written to a church in my area. I had actually written to four or five churches in my area, explaining my story and um, my battle with addiction and looking for a church home. And do you know, not a single one of them wrote me back. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes um, what it would have been like if one of them would have reached out to me. But when I was in prison, God made me a promise, okay? And there's this little known verse, and I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it's when the angel comes to Mary and tells her that she's um, going to have Jesus. And she said, the Bible says, and Mary treasured up these things in her heart. So there are things that God has promised me um, that I don't share with people, but they're just, for me, it, it just helps my relationship with him and I've I've treasured these things in my heart but one of these things that he said to me is I will restore to you the years that the locusts have stolen and I always wondered but he said this to me back in like 2015 I was just starting my prison sentence part of it and I couldn't fathom that and when I got out and Fox River um did that offering and they gave me some money and Gail let me live in her house and all these all the clothes that I have for the most part have been donated um when someone helped me find a car when someone gave me a discount on getting the stuff done in my car this this, this word from God keeps coming up into my mind right and it shattered the view that I had of Christians and Christianity. And I think that through ministries like this, I think God is bringing together the bone. I think about Ezekiel all the time and the dry bones. It's a story, a parable that God has been speaking to me a lot about lately. And I think this is God bringing together the bones. And you might not know exactly where the vision is going yet, but you have, you have, you have the raw material you have your drive, you have your vision, and you have the spirit of God. And it says that, you know, we will worship in spirit and in truth. And I think that that is what God is doing through this ministry, is bringing together the bones. And we might not know exactly where it's going to lead yet, but the fact that you're even open to doing something like this is amazing to me because I really didn't think anybody 
scared. Mm -hmm. And I I almost felt like, you know, Elijah when he runs under the juniper tree and he's just like, there's nobody left. And God's like, no, there's always a remnant. I always have a remnant. And for me, that's what the people that I have met in here and like Gail and Paul, to me, that is the remnant in a world that is utter chaos right now. The remnant is coming back to life. And I think that for me has been the greatest blessing is to come home and to witness that even though the devil tried back in 2010, when I got out after my 14 and a half months, he tried to give me this false view of the church when he, when those churches didn't respond to me. And I again walked away from God because I had started reading the Bible again in, two, in 2009, 2010 when I said that 14 and a half months. But he halted that successfully when those churches didn't respond to me. But even now, even though he planted those seeds of doubt, even now God is restoring the years that the canker worm and the locust have stolen from me. And it's, it's hard because God's timetable isn't our timetable. But he's Amen. never, he's never <laughs> yeah. promised something that hasn't come true. And that, so that's why I'm like, you guys got to write stuff down because <laughs> I forget stuff. I forget stuff. And it's not until a person asks me to share and I start thinking about these things that I'm like, yeah, he's been there the whole time. The devil might throw in the weeds, but the wheat's been there the whole time. Yeah, Nathan, what do you think? Connect online, shattering the personal. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, I've got another question for Nikki, but I'm wondering if anybody, Mary or Jim or anybody have anything else? Well, Nikki, let me ask you this. Where do you feel God is directing you now? <laughs> <laughs> that isn't that the million dollar can question? i answer this question <laughs> i live with please, this kid please do <laughs> what day is it it just depends what day it is nathan <laughs> okay honestly it's, though, it's it's hard because i'm i'm so impatient with him and he is so good to me because I feel like he I'm like how is he not sick of me right now I literally like bombard the throne room with questions all the time right um but for now so I have been working with the ACLU and I do believe that um God is trying to shine a light in certain areas but I I believe that school is to hone the skills that he has given me. And what I are you think, going to school for? Well, I'm going to school for the <laughs> Associate of Arts program. <laughs> what does a person do with the Associate of Arts? Good question, Nathan. I am not quite sure, but that is the door that the Lord opened. So yeah, we sure. shall walk through it um, yeah, for, <laughs> for, for transferable yeah. credits. And then I will hopefully transfer to Wheaton in about a year, year and a half for communications. So, <laughs> One of my, um, one of the things that I've always been apprehensive about is, you know, in the, the parable with the talents and the, the one servant that said that he, he was afraid and he buried his talents. And then there was the one that had five and the one that had 10. So the way that I viewed it is these are the gifts that God has given me. I will do what I can to hone them. And as the doors open up, I will use them because I would be so, it's terrifying to me to think that I would stand before God and say that I buried this because the devil planted seeds of inadequacy back when I was five. You know, I, even though he, he is graceful and loving, I just, I love him too much to stand before him at the end of my life and say, I didn't do everything I can to give you a return on what you gave me. Um, so that is my that is my thought process with school and I'm working um because I like the feeling of like okay somebody we need like 10 fans or whatever I can cover 10 fans it's nice to be able to to be able to serve and to give to the kingdom of God to be able to give back to ministries that um 
that helped me while I was in prison. So I'm trying not to quit either one of my jobs because it would be really nice to be able to give at the level that I'm still giving. And um, I think hard work is really good for the soul. I, when I was in my drugs and stuff, like I was super lazy and um, there is such a value in labor, manual labor for me personally. Um, and I might whine and complain on some days that I'm tired and I need more coffee. And But God has refined my character. And to tell you the truth, he has taught me some interesting things while I was cleaning toilets. I don't understand it, but there's something in cleaning and, and doing these, I don't know, what you would consider mundane tasks that the Holy Spirit seems to speak to me in the middle. And I'm, I'm terrified of losing that. So I'm working, I'm going to go to school. And if God, op- anytime God opens up something in ministry to be able to testify to his goodness, I'm there. Like I figure it out, I'm there. Yeah, I, I would. I like the that, especially that last sentence that you said there. Um, you know, and and I'm all for encouraging you in the education and things like that. But that's that is not a prerequisite to doing your ministry. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, you're already doing ministry, and you know, I mean, what you're doing here with us, and uh, um, and you know, and I. I'm so excited to have you as one of the group leaders for my daughter for the, um, for, you know, the, the high school. Um, so it's, it's just, uh, you know, yeah, we, we definitely want to encourage you as well. Um, in fact, that's kind of my next question is what can we do to, or how can we pray for you? Um, I, so in all the busyness, my, my main worry, my, the one thing that I always seem to worry about is that I would somehow lose God, right? Like he could be lost. I, I should know that threaded throughout my life, he wouldn't let me lose him. You know, he didn't bring me this far to lose me here. But I, I get worried that the noise of the world, hmm. um, I know that, so the parable of the soils, I think is the most important parable in the whole Bible. And I think um, personally for me, everything hinges on that because if you don't know what soil you are, you don't know how to accurately fight the devil. And I'm thorny soil and I get easily distracted by the cares of the world. So I have to guard against that. And um, for me, my, my prayer request is that I, in the busyness of life would never lose my relationship with God that I would continue to grow deeper with him I'm never satisfied in that regard and it is one of my my burdens but I think it is my blessing as well because I never feel close enough to God I always want more I always want more I just got to know more I just got to see him more I just got to feel like I just need him and it was easier to have him in the prison now I have to um now I have to create pockets of time with him and my pursuit of him, however, has increased. And I hope that, I hope he, I hope he understands that I love him. And so that is my prayer request that I would continue to grow closer to God and the busyness of the world would not distract me from him. Right. Right. Well, why don't we close in prayer? Um, Justin or Jennifer, would you be willing to start and then uh, I can finish? Put him on the spot. You know. What's that? I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, I'm just wowed by what continues to develop here and uh, you know how your able to use uh, brokenness, tragedy, weakness, um, and, and turn it into your glory and uh, use it as your roadmap in your book uh, to help others. It's it, uh, never ceased by your amazement and listening to Nikki speak to looking back at, uh, and, and it, as you know, she spoke, I, I thought of those same things. I thought of those bookmarks, you know, in my story, uh, personally, you know, of, of, of what you've done and, and 
where you've you've brought me where you know this this group is developing the particular you know people that you've you've um you know sur surrounded me my family my you know my friends and every and uh um gosh i, I just we're we're so we're so blessed uh, you know i don't i don't know if i'm, I'm Go in the right direction with this even it's just what you've laid on my heart right now to say and um what an amazing uh night this has been and continue to look forward to uh, what the vision is and 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 bring in more rawness around this because i think that's really how uh you impact uh people and with that i just again say thank you we love you i raise everyone here up to you and um you know turn this over to uh to nathan to continue Heavenly father uh, i echo what uh, justin has said and lord we all have a story and you've been in pursuit of all of us uh, lord help us to not forget that as nikki said um Help us to remember how much you love us. I mean, you love us so much that you were willing to sacrifice your son for us. And that's something that's, that we should be on our knees thanking you uh, for. And uh, there's no greater love than that. And, and Lord, I, I thank you for uh, the message that, uh, that Nikki shared with us. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would continue to, to walk with her, bless her footsteps, uh, as she goes to school, uh, bless her footsteps in the work world, bless her footsteps in the, in the mission field that she's in right now. And uh, continue to open doors that she should walk through and, and uh, close the doors that, you, that, would, that she shouldn't walk through. Um, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for her. Thank you for Jim and Mary. Thank you for Justin and Jennifer. And, and of course, uh, Gail and, uh, and my wife, Pam, sitting next to me here. It's in Jesus' name we, we come together. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thanks, you for inviting me. Gail, um, good to see you. Maybe we can see you a few more times soon. So yeah. <laughs> hope you can join us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was uh it's it's been quite a um experience. God bless praises just to watch Nikki grow. Mm -hmm. Um, I watched her grow for two and a half years in prison and uh, mm. to bring her out into the real world, right? Which is just, you know, we joke the whole world went down on lockdown the minute she gets out, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, what's wrong with this picture here? I've been living to get out and now I can't get out of the house. You know, it's like, there's worse places, I guess. But um, it's just, uh, it's been such a blessing for us to be able to give and to help her and um, I, yeah, I, all the glory to God and mm -hmm. my wonderful husband who never met this young woman He's and not. said, sure, she can live with us, <laughs> you know, and it, it was, it's, it's just, you know, it's all, and he's a godly man and it, it, it's, it's all good. It's really, really good. And it, it's been quite an adventure, um, watching her grow and all the good things that have happened, even during COVID with um, all, the, all the obstacles that she had to overcome to be the independent woman that she is now, um, that she can make more decisions on her own, that she doesn't, you know, doesn't need to be guided so much, you know? I mean, we love consulting with her and loving on her and being her parents, you know, here, here in New Berlin. We joke about that too, but we won't go into those jokes. <laughs> She's a little tanner than I am, so sometimes that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she gets to see a different world, right? We get to yeah. see a different world, and we both get to have more compassion and more um, kindness and gentleness because of it, you know? And so she's helped us grow, um, you know, my husband and I. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. so... Hoping, hoping in the next year or two that I can continue this journey with other women um, and mentor. And, uh, and I think, you know, you asked Nikki where she's going and, um, you know, she has a passion for God. She has a passion for women in prison. She has a passion for communication. 
um, this child has, I'm sorry, this young woman <laughs> has a, uh, you know, a vocabulary that bars none. I mean, I have to look up words after she leaves the room because I'm like, I don't even know what she just, you know, and she's got, like you said, she's got a gift. And um, I, I, I hope that she can bring that hope to these women um, that are, you know, very, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard place, you know, and it's, I was there for two and a half years and that's how I got to meet Nikki. And uh, uh, she wanted to change. She wanted to grow and she wanted to be more obedient to God. And uh, she's just doing it. And uh, we, my husband and I were just talking about that the other day. I go, boy, she sure consults with God a lot. And he goes, well, that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> and he goes, she's the one who's obedient in this house. <laughs> 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 I'm obedient, don't you? You know, so it's it's you know it's all very it's it's good, but she's you know it's it's great. I, I if I if I if I ever was doubting what my purpose was in life, um, I I know now, and I mm. it's because I get to love on this girl. So, mm. oh, I love you. I know, I love you too. So, with that, I'm going to call my other daughter up in Minneapolis. So, thank you Sounds so much good. for letting me thank participate. You. Yeah. See ya. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Bye, guys. Thanks, thank you. Bye, Jim and Mary.